I'm Lance Lucas, and I am Baltimore Rewired. In 1972, my mother graduated from Morgan State University. So let's give it up for Morgan, everybody. Come on. Thank you, Morgan, for hosting this beautiful campus. She was also a Delta. My dad was coming home from Vietnam, and he was doing what young guys usually do. He comes over here scoping for girls, you know. And he falls in love with my mom. They get married. He has a job at Bethlehem Steel. She's a teacher in Baltimore City Schools, and they move to Northwest Baltimore. First generation of African Americans to move in this uh, affluent uh, neighborhood in Northwest Baltimore at the time. And myself thinking like, this is great, you know, I, I, I have a great mom, a great dad, but when I was eight, like a lot of people, my parents split. And that dream and that, uh, of that nuclear family, it was something different. And I became very emotionally distressed. And from that emotional distress, I became rebellious. And I was not the model teenager. I, my motto was a see or see you through. You know, I was not that top performer. And eventually, I was in my 12th grade year, and I liked uh, movies and fashion shows, and I had this habit. I had, I had been uh, watching a fashion show talent show at my school before I graduated, and I wanted to make some money off of it. So I made some tickets, and I sold some fake tickets, and I got arrested and expelled in my senior year. <laughs> and you know, I like to say it was something dangerous, but it was for fashion show tickets. And uh, my mom was nevertheless still disappointed being a teacher. This was just so horrible. And, I, you know, I never got suspended, anything. And so I went off to the military for nine months for training, and I was in the U.S. Army Reserves at 17. And when I went away and I came back, mom packed up. She moved in with my aunt, and I really didn't have a place to really uh, live. And I was, you know, I was of age, so, you know, our parents get sometimes, they're like, you're old enough, you're on your own. She saw me through night school to get my high school diploma. She did everything in her power, but it was my time to do my thing. But I was essentially homeless, 18 years old in Baltimore City. And I knew one thing she taught me is, as long as you get your education, you'll be okay. So I went on, I worked three jobs. I went to Coppin State University, my alma mater, please get up for Coppin. I know we at Morgan, <laughs> Eagles forever. And going there, um, I learned so much, but I also had a job at night at a place called Staples. I think we all know Staples, right? And I got hired as a computer salesman and then a computer technician, and I thought it was so cool I got paid to learn about computers. I had to beg the manager to let me work in this department because this department was something they wanted experience for, but I became one of their best salesmen. So that was my entry into the technology field. I went to COP and I talked to one of my favorite professors. I said, this stuff is awesome. It's not that difficult. I would like to teach this. He said, you get 10 people, you train them. If they get a job, people will take you seriously. I said, okay. And I learned by doing, not by watching. So I started a little program and our first students were Aunt Hattie's group homes, a group of young men. So I started teaching. And then as I'm selling computers one night, I sold a laptop to this older gentleman, and his name was Raymond V. Haysburg. And I did, a, you know, I sold it, did my thing. He said, you did a really good job of selling me that laptop. Well, how'd you like to take my business course? I said, you know, I'm a little busy, but tell me about it. Later, I come to find out that Raymond Haysburg owned the first African-American company on the stock market. He was Tuskegee Airmen in World War II, and the founding member of places like Harbor Bank and Verizon. I didn't know that at the time. I just figured it was, you know, some guy buying a laptop. But I remained a student of his until he passed away in 2010. So you have a young person with these great business mentors, great technology background, and a willingness to teach at 22 years old. So 15 years later, what do you have? Tracy and Trayvon Leonard. I met with Mr. Lucas at Baltimore Talent Development High School. Um, he got me my first certification. Mr. Lucas gave me this little number at Housing Authority, and three months later I was in the A-plus program. Me and my brother were in the same situation. We were both in the shelter, 
um, not being able to eat, not being able to close ourselves. And um, when Mr. Lucas gave me the number, he told me if I knew anyone else who wanted to get in the program, then give him the number. So I put my brother on and I put my homegirl Destiny on and we all went through the program together, top of our class. I was 17 and I was living with my mother. I was in my, they are my twins. Junior, yeah, high school and uh, things wasn't working out there. So I moved in with my aunt and things wasn't working with my aunt after about a year. So I moved back in with my mother and after high school, my mother kicked me out. Uh, I was moving from shelter to shelter. It was it was it was hard because like I had to carry my clothes with me everywhere I went, no matter where I went. All my clothes were with me in a bag, a blue bag, and it was it was kind of embarrassing because like, I didn't have nowhere to go. So I went down to my aunt. She told me to go down to North Avenue and to one of the programs down there, and they sent me to Road Street Shelter. Once my brother came, he was like, I'm tired of this. I, I know a way we can get out of this situation. And I was focused on, I was focused on getting out the situation. I was working on getting a job and everything. Like I was in a program with Prime America and I, was, I started working with uh, people's finances. And my brother was like, I know an even faster way. So I was like, really? And so he was, so he introduced me to Mr. Lucas. We came up here to see Mr. Lucas one day, right after we finished cleaning up the trash. And, Mr. Lucas told us to go see Miss Little, and we went to go see Miss Little, and they put us in the program. Three months later, I was A plus certified, and then like three months after that, I was teaching in the, in high schools. And at the teaching in the high schools, like I started two businesses with my brother: entertainment business and a, a technology business, repairing and and maintaining computers. And from there, this is where I am now. I got my own place. I got my own place with my brother. Uh, and I'm working to, to continue to better myself to, to, to reach my, the rest of my goals. All right. Yeah, I love Tracy Trayvon. They mentioned that they had a friend. Her name was Destiny Thomas, Thompson. And she was 21, had a nine-month-old baby, and was in that homeless shelter with them. <clears throat> She came in, and A-plus, for those who don't know, that's a computer technician. That's one of the first steps to get into cybersecurity. That's one of the things we do along with robotics and video game design and anything to do with cybersecurity or technology. And Destiny went through the class. It was difficult emotionally. She finished. She got certified. And she got a job with a subsidiary of Rockstar Video Games, which is one of the largest video game companies in the world. She moved on now, and she currently is one of the senior technicians at the Staples in Catonsville, and she has her own place. We're not talking about just coming in in theory. We're talking about actually putting people to work and also creating job creators and entrepreneurs and things of that nature. You look at quality education. 20% certification rate is what's the average for for-profit schools and most community colleges in cybersecurity. And these are with folks with college reading levels. We have an 85% certification rate with individuals with fourth grade to eighth grade reading levels. So we have a higher certification rate than the average with individuals that are considered untapped populations. And the way that we do this is we look at what models are out there. Finland has the best school system in the world. They put one to five student teacher ratio. They choose the best graduates. We choose professionals. We keep small classroom sizes. We use something called double down, where we meet people where they are. And we also, we don't ever say a question is dumb. Everything is a new way to open a person up. And then we look at opportunities. Two months ago, I was speaking on a panel with the likes of Mr. Guts, the chief technology officer of the CIA, the chief technology officer of Air Force and TSA. And they're like, well, why are you here? Because the federal government's interested in creating a pipeline to cybersecurity and education. I also was a keynote speaker at an event for NSA called Computer Mania to get young women into, young women, minority women specifically, into technology, into STEM, 
and I'm sitting there talking to parents, which is the hardest audience, and I'm trying to explain to them what these certifications mean as a validation of the skills. And, you know, academia and the, a lot of times the certificates have this battle going on about, oh, you can't use one without the other, and I'll put it like this. Certifications are peanut butter. The long-term degrees are jelly. They taste good separately, but it tastes better together, especially for employers. There's a 1.6 unemployment rate for IT in the Baltimore, D.C. metropolitan area. This is considered the Silicon Valley of cybersecurity. I have IT staffing companies come to me all the time. Let me hire 50 of your people. There is a way to get them placed if they can get certified as a first credential. We meet them where they're at in their neighborhoods. We work with over 60 schools. We've donated over 3,000 computers. I was backstage. A gentleman said, did you donate some computers to Extreme Makeover to some people? I said, oh, yeah, I did. You know, you never know who you touch with technology. We also donated computer labs to every housing project in Baltimore City. We work with the federal government to make sure that we can refurbish those computers and put that technology out there. You think about poverty. Poverty is like the flu. And the symptoms are sneezing and runny nose. You don't treat the symptoms, you treat the flu. Poverty, violence, ignorance are symptoms of poverty, and the only inoculant in every study around the world is education. So we bring the education to the people on their level with simplified curriculum focused on job creation, economic development, and entrepreneurship. Now, my journey has brought me to this point where we've helped over 3,000 folks, six computer labs downtown. None of that means anything unless we have these individual stories of people going from not having anything to eat to having something to eat and providing for their families. And that's what we do this for. It's kind of like love and the business plan for myself. Now, when you look at these communities, a lot of people say, well, these communities are just devastated. Like one community, Rosemount, 25% unemployment for 20 years. That's like having the Great Depression for 20 years. If you had a Ford factory or you had a technology business there, that crime would drop. Malcolm Gladwell has a book called The Tipping Point, and he talks about when professionals drop in a neighborhood, crime explodes by 20, 30 percent. So what we want to do is organically grow professionals in the neighborhoods to become workable role models for the people where they're at, going where they're at, developing where they're at, and uplifting. We have a couple of ideas in the future that we're working on right now. We just purchased a data center. We're working with Park Heights, and we're doing something called Street Geeks. Where we're teaching young people to work with cloud technology, develop mobile apps with our chairman, Peter Daniels, and my partner, uh, Joseph Sutton, and uh, Mr. Renwick Bass and Timothy Brown. We're working as companies to come together to employ these folks, to put our money where our mouth is and look towards the future. There'll be a trillion dollars generated in cloud in the United States of America and this year alone, and 15 million jobs generated in cloud worldwide. We have to prepare them for the opportunity. If Tiger Woods didn't have a golf club, he wouldn't be in golf. If you didn't have boxing gloves, you wouldn't have somebody like uh, Mike Tyson or Michael Jordan. If we don't have the uniform, we can't play. Let's give them the things that they need so they can play the game. Our next Mark Zuckerberg, our next Bill Gates could come from anywhere. Thank you very much. I'm Lance Lucas, and I am Baltimore Rewired. Thank you.